so I understand that this film was actually, or, or this, this is based on a young adult uh, novel, uh, which became a passion project for you, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, Brock Cole had written the book called The Goats. Um, almost, I think it was probably the early 80s when I had read it, and sort of it was one of those that stuck with me. And, and as the years sort of progressed, you know, Howie was um, a character that I just... You know, you read something, and whether it's The Catcher in the Rye or Holden Caulfield, Howie was just a character that I just, like, so related to in a, in a really personal way. It's just one of those that kind of stuck with me. And when I had a little window many years later and had a little bit of, I don't know, more, you know, respect or power in the industry, I just felt like, God, it would be great to make a movie like this. Or, you know, Truffaut got to do 400 Blows, and even David Seltzer made a beautiful movie called Lucas, which I love so much. And, and you know, my life as a dog, it's like, for, for the type of films I made, whenever I tell people I love these small coming of age stories, they look at me and go, like, you really love those? And this, was, this was one of those that I felt like, God, this could kind of be mine. And, you know, we got enough uh, we got enough support and, you know, got a little bit of money and went out and shot in 18 days. And it was really beautiful and pure, but it was, it was definitely the novel and, and the character of Howie. Uh, that Brock created that like really spoke to me, and I felt like I, you know, that we were sort of akin, Howie and myself. And and how what, what were those qualities that that you found? The qualities over? were I I was never I was a I was always a, a really sort of a good athlete, but I I didn't fit in kind of like with the jocks and and sort of the stoners and and what we called sort of like the the hard the heavy metal metal bangers in the, my high school. I just, I never really felt like I was part of a group, that I was always kind of on the outside, sort of on the peripheral, sort of floating around. And and I've always felt like um, victims particularly, like I think the interesting part about like the zeitgeist of how this is, even though this is stories in the 80s and how bullying becomes so sort of such a great relevant topic to attack and to try to stop, that I've always felt like this bizarre... I don't want to say guilt, I guess it was guilt, like of not ever stepping in and kind of just being quiet, that kind of quiet observer when, when other kids were being cruel to, to other kids. Mm. And it's sort of something that I kind of harbored and carried with me. And I just felt like this, Howie was just one of those guys. And, and being a filmmaker, I always, my imagination was always running wild. And there's a point in this, in the book and in the movie where Howie tells Grace, like, hey, um, um, uh, I, I just wanted this, I, you know, I had this fantasy that we can just keep going and, like, this whole adventure. And you realize, like, his his mind and his fantasy, like, this little adventure is one of the great moments of his life, even though it's coming off one of the most horrific experiences. And I always think us you know, as storytellers and filmmakers, our imagination is always kind of getting us ahead of and what would it be like. And so I just felt, I felt like we were, you know, sort of brothers in arms in a way. And so it made, yeah. it, made, it, made, it, it, made it, it made it feel important. It made at least it feel important to me that I wanted to make something. Uh, yeah, I understand that very much. Uh, you know, and, and earlier you mentioned that you had first read the novel probably in the early 80s. And when I was watching the movie, I, I was thinking to myself, you know, they there's plenty of animated films today. There's there's lots of superhero movies, but there aren't real-world movies that deal with young life uh, like there were in the 80s. Uh, exactly. I mean, do you find that to be the case? I do find that to be the case, and like I said, being the father of five children from, you know, teenage, upper teenagers all the way down to a five-year-old, it's interesting because I sit in the movies with them, and, and, you know, if it's not a Pixar movie or the exceptional, like, a Despicable Me Too or I Can Laugh, I've always I felt like, oh, my gosh, they're just getting so ripped off. Like, they're just mm. not getting any of the experiences we had. And, and it's funny, too, because I even had this conversation with someone last week where, like, with John Hughes movies, be like art films <laughs> compared to today and what these kids are getting because even though they're funny and entertaining and crazy and the music's fantastic, there's always a little bit something deeper going on. Um, and I, I do feel that. I feel like there's such a void. And, and like I said, I mentioned you know movies like Lucas and you know even little little films like Gilbert Grape and things that are just like they never ever exploded, but they just they're going to live forever. And um, I feel like. It'd be great if we can get a shift, and, and I think maybe you know with these VODs and DVDs and lower budget movies, the, the more eyes we can get on these little movies, the better. Because you know, it, it's interesting with this film. Like this film had a chance. Like there was a lot of people who really bigger distributors who were going to jump on it, but they didn't. They didn't have the marketing money. They, they couldn't get it out in 1,500 screens. They couldn't justify spending 20 million dollars to market a three million dollar movie. I get it. I understand. But I think that's the studio mentality with taking those chances. They don't want to 
they know there's great quality material out there that can be made, but they're not willing to really, really roll the dice because even a $3 million movie needs a $15 million marketing scheme. You know? Right. I think that, right. That's what makes it difficult. So hopefully these new platforms, if you can make them for cheap enough and you know get, get eyeballs on them in the big cities and hopefully the DOD, that you, know, that, that you can get people to see them. Because you do the one great test screen we had on a Sunday in like Huntington Beach you know, that was the, it's funny that you say that, that was the one comment, they're like, we're just looking for movies like this, uh, mm. just to take our kids to, because it's like, it's it's either the fun, animated, let's laugh, and, you know, I do think there's some beautiful poetry in the Pixar films, of course, um, but yeah, it's, it's I, I'm, I do miss these, I do miss, like, you know, those movies we had in the 80s that allowed us to. Experience. Yeah, absolutely, and, and, and your film fits right into that. Another thing that I really appreciated about, appreciated about your film was the fact that the, these felt like honest, uh, truthful characters, these kids. And is it a challenge when you're writing young parts for younger kids um, not to make those characters too precious or, or, or I don't know if the word is pander to them when – no, it's an excellent point because I, I find that we tend to write whenever, whenever you get to, I say, author's message, you know, and you definitely have children sort of, you know, dealing with things that are get thematic, and you, you know, I was finding myself the biggest challenge in writing the piece was saying like, how do I, how do I, how do I pull this off, you know, from a from a character growth standpoint, and and have it still be in a way that a an 11-year-old or 12-year-old would speak it. And that's what I found to be one of the biggest challenges in the writing. And and I think, you know, you you, you have to just really, you know, play with it. And, and in the rehearsal period, too, uh, we had a couple days of rehearsal there, and I just had to read it, and I would just listen. I wouldn't really comment on it, but I can tell when it was sort of a, a 40, mid-40s or upper 40-year-old man's voice <laughs> trying to say what a child should say, and I'd be like, oh, God, what was I doing? i got to cross that out. i got to change that. And so it was a real challenge. And um, have, like I said, having children from 5 all the way to 19 now or 18, um, I feel like I have a pretty decent ear for what's age-appropriate speak. And so I don't know how it came across, but I hopefully, hopefully it felt right. It did feel right. It was very truthful. And I was actually going to ask you about your children and, and, and the age range, because especially when you're making a film like this or, or, or possibly an I Am Number Four, do you, do you value their perspective to know if it's truthful to, to, to what they would, how they would want to be portrayed? Yeah, I do. I try, I try to gauge that, obviously. And again, because we do have that, you know, that full spectrum, it's interesting what you know, a 15-year-old boy and a you know an 11-year-old girl have sort of different interests, but at the same time, I think the truth you you can just see and, and discuss it when 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 you're not being truthful and when things aren't fully paying off or when it's something that you think might have been funny that you think's hilarious and you sit there and you're watching them watch your rough cut and they're both they're all standing there with no no smiles on their face or or if I first you realize like you know what <laughs> what what's working and what's not working for for them is different and that's where that's where directing becomes really difficult. Uh, particularly in the post-production stage, because you kind of have to gauge it. But it's nice to have that full spectrum. And like I said, it was funny because it's funny that you say that. Like the one movie that we all sat at, and we, like, we you know, it's hard to get the whole family together. But when you have seven people sitting there, and I'll never forget uh, Toy Story three when we all sat there, and literally we all enjoyed the movie on such different levels. And that's mm. when you realize how brilliant those guys were in creating a movie that parents are sitting there crying because it's sort of the loss of the innocence and the kid going to college and passing off the toys and, and then everything else in there, just plain, pure, beautiful, fun entertainment for the two little ones. And you realize, like, you know, it's interesting to see when a movie can hit all of that. 